Excellencies, distinguished government officials, development and private sector partners, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, a very warm welcome to this Colombo Development Dialogue, the first of its kind uh, in Colombo. I would like to uh, wish you a very warm welcome, but also hope that we will engage very actively in the dialogue for the next two hours. This is the first of a series of development dialogues that we are launching in Sri Lanka, together with the London School of Economics, South Asia Center uh, of Economic and Political Science. And we are very pleased to see so many of you here today. Each dialogue will focus on a specific theme and today's theme will be on integrated development impact through partnerships and innovation. We have a large lineup of interesting speakers today who will each touch on a different element under this theme. And we hope that you will engage in the discussion and that we will have a, a very exciting dialogue as we're moving forward. We're trying to do this as a little bit different than we normally uh, are seeing these kind of in interactions. So uh, basically everything goes. The Colombo Development Dialogues is not just an event. It's also what I had hoped you will see from the pictures here uh, on the screen. It's about contributing to development, to the discourse, and through what we call the master classes. And we had one of these master classes today at the University of Colombo. And that's what you see on the pictures there. And I understand it was a tremendous exchange with the students. Again, something slightly different what we normally are doing, but uh, something that really engaged the students, I understand, in a very participatory and innovative way. It is also about setting the agenda in the development landscape and it's about bringing together a range of stakeholders to take this discussion forward through the development of a working policy paper. But let me take this opportunity to thank our partners for supporting this initiative. First, the South Asia Center for London School of Economics and Political Science for having made the way all the way to Colombo. We hope this will be a long-standing collaboration the Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Colombo, Dilmati, and the CITRA Social Innovation Lab, and of course, all the panel members today. I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Banerjee, the Director of the London School of Economics South Asia Center, to come on stage and to start the proceedings. So with those few words, I would like to thank you for coming, and I would like to wish you a very good and interactive and productive afternoon. Thank you. Um, my job today, um, thank you for wel welcoming everybody on our behalf. Um, I must say on behalf of the LSE South Asia Center, my colleagues at LSE, staff and students, it is a very important moment uh, for the center to be here in Colombo. Uh, the idea of the South Asia Center is really to aggregate the enormous amount of research that goes on about uh, South Asia at LSE. I don't know how many of you know but LSE has possibly, and I continue to say arguably and possibly because we haven't exactly checked, checked the numbers, but we have more academics working on South Asia in the social sciences at LSE than any other university in the world in the social sciences. We have over 70, 75 full-time academic faculty. We have postdocs, PhD students. There's an enormous body of research that is being generated at LSE about uh, South Asia, on South Asia. 
And the South Asia Center, which was set up only uh, less than three years ago in June 2015, is an effort to uh, create thematic conversations within the university which go beyond disciplines, which talk about issues uh, such as sustainable development goals or water security or urbanization or agriculture uh, across disciplines, right from economics to sociology, geography. LSE teaches 25 different social sciences, after all. It's not just the economics and political science in the title. Um, and to create, through these conversations, bridges with conversations with other stakeholders outside academia. You got me. Okay. Um, so the idea is to create, continue. We are a university. I'm an academic myself. I'm a social anthropologist, a sociologist. I would be in Sri Lanka. Uh, and I have an academic role to play in the Department of Anthropology where I teach. But as director of the South Asia Center, my job is really to create those conversations across the school on these important issues, but also to take these conversations across to other sectors, both within the UK, but also very importantly in the regions itself. So today, I'm told, is an auspicious day in Sri Lanka in so many ways. Um, and it is a very important day for us to make an auspicious start uh, to this collaboration uh, for which we are very grateful to UNDP, to the energy of some fantastic young people uh, who we've been working with, um, to create a new kind of dialogue, to create a new kind of conversation. And Colombo Development Dialogues is exactly trying to achieve this uh, unity of purpose of creating capacity amongst young people to think, debate, question, uh, analyze, uh, and create new research agendas, as we did with the masterclass this morning, uh, through the panel discussion today, where we are uh, going to hear from some a fantastic lineup of speakers, and then have a, a discussion session with discussants in the audience and from you, uh, who've taken the time to be here today, for which we are very grateful. And then, so that these discussions don't get lost in the ether, in thin air, when these kinds of events end, we want these discussions to have an afterlife and a future. So we are going to create a, a working policy paper that we can then disseminate and use as the basis of future conversations. We've already set the date for the next Colombo Development Dialogue, uh, in August, and we'll tell you about more about that uh, later. So I can't but also help add a small private word of thanks to the many LSE alumni in the room. And I know there are many within the UNDP and within the city of Colombo. For all of you, can I have all alumni raise their hands, please? Fantastic. So we have a critical mass of, of alumni in the room, and uh, in LSE, we enjoy debate and discussion. We like the awkward questions. We like being challenged. So I hope uh, our Q&A will be very um, lively later on. So to start with, I, I'm going to, uh, just to explain how we are going to run this for the next couple of hours or so. Uh, we will, um, we have, uh, as you can see, there are several chairs on the stage. There are, uh, we'll have panelists up on stage who I'm going to invite in a minute. Uh, who are all going to speak for about five minutes each. But we will start with Dr. Venu Gopal, who is my colleague at LSE, teaches in the International Development Department, who just by virtue of being an LSE academic gets 15 minutes. You know, you can't train them in. So he gets 15 minutes, all the others get five, uh, which is uh, not to say anything about how important what they have uh, to say, but Rajesh is going to sort of lay out, he's the continuity between the morning and the afternoon. He conducted the masterclass this morning. So we will have our uh, panelists speak for five minutes each, and then I'll open the floor to questions. Uh, there are some of you who've been invited to pose questions, and I'll call on you first. And then we genuinely want questions from the floor and, and have a discussion uh, amongst, and, and you can direct them specifically to a panelist, a speaker, or I will direct questions. And at the end, we will try and tie up some of these themes together so that our three hardworking rapporteurs who are recording 
uh, the proceedings today will have uh, something concrete to put into the working policy paper. So I hope that's not too complicated. Let's give it a shot. This is the first time we are doing it, um, and let's hope it works. So um, uh, can I invite on stage first His Excellency Tung Lai Mark? Uh, please, um, I think you're wherever, uh, somewhere, here. Um, <laughs> just next to me, um, uh, who is the EU ambassador to Sri Lanka and the Maldives. Uh, on my left is Ms. Dulani Sirisena. Uh, no, uh, is that right? Yes, uh, uh, from the Australian High Commission. Um, and then we have Ms. Sonali Dairatna, uh, policy and design specialist, UNDP Sri Lanka, please. Uh, I think your names are on the chairs, so you know where to go. Um, and then we have Dr. Rajesh Venugopal, uh, LSE academic at the International Development Department. Uh, Mr. Carl Cruz, Chairman Unilever Sri Lanka, over there. Um, and then Dr. Manisha Vanasinghe, Senior Lecturer, University of Colombo. Uh, please. We are going to be joined later, slightly later in the evening, uh, in the proceedings in about half an hour's time by Dr. Indrajit uh, Kumaraswamy, Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, who uh, understandably is a busy man and uh, has, is going to come in slightly later, so he will uh, slip in there, but you know who he is, of course. Uh, so I'm going to, without further ado, invite uh, Dr. Venugopal to make his uh, opening remarks for 15 minutes, and then we'll uh, go straight on after that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay, well, thank, thank you first. Uh, thank you very much to UNDP for organizing this event, for inviting uh, all of us over from, from different parts of the world to come over here. Um, <coughs> I'm going to start by uh, talking about the fact that development dialogues in Sri Lanka, when I came across them, were often very pessimistic. It was common to lament over past mistakes. The story of development uh, was often posed in terms of missed opportunities. And uh, I had a very memorable uh, conversation once with a very leading Sri Lankan academic uh, many years ago, who said that, well, in Sri Lanka, we never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Now, having said that, I think, I think it's a widespread myth uh, and wishful thinking to some extent that things could have gone differently, which people always like to talk about, that Sri Lanka could, if it had done different things, have become Singapore or Malaysia today. Now, this is not really something new. I mean, uh, I mean I'm an academic. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, the famous Cambridge economist Joan Robinson uh, very famously said, in the context of the rice subsidy, that uh, Ceylon has planted, the f has tasted the fruit before she has planted the tree. Now, having said that, I think historical hindsight and this idea of what could have been is, is very speculative. I, you can't rewind history like a DVD and, and play it back differently. Uh, how do we really know what, what could have transpired? So I'm not trying to say that there have been no mistakes in the past. Clearly, there have been. But I also don't want us to forget, as we start out here, that Sri Lanka is very well known and very famous for certain things in a very positive way in terms of its contribution. Sri Lanka is a country that unusually for a, a small poor, low-income country in the 1950s, when it was newly independent, had unusually high levels of health and education and unusually low levels of infant mortality or maternal mortality, uh, low levels of malnutrition, very, very significant and imp impressive social programs that were apparently unheard, that, that were unprecedented, unheard of for a country of that level of economic wealth. 
So what I'm saying is, let's not forget that amidst all of the negativity that one often hears, that there is actually a lot of, uh, there is a great positive um, heritage and inheritance that one has. Sri Lanka had an enormous positive impact on the rest of the world, on imagining what could be done, what could be possible, what it was possible for a small, poor country to do. Now, having said that, I'm just going to move on to my next point, which is quite different. I'm going to use this opportunity to highlight some of the big issues that confront Sri Lanka today and to try to use that to frame um, our conversation on development dialogues. And there are really two categories of things I'm going to talk about. The first is, is things that are out there but are not really in Sri Lanka's control, but that Sri Lanka needs to manage and try to cope with. And the first one of those things is, is the big elephant in the room, which is climate change. Uh, Sri Lanka did not really contribute much to the world's problem of climate change, but it definitely faces the consequences. Um, and it has now got to deal, to some extent, with the mitigation, but also, much more importantly, perhaps, with the problem of adaptation, of coping with a changing climate as the world heads headlong into what is looking like a set of irreversible tipping points. So that's the first point, climate change. The second point, demography. Sri Lanka once in the 1950s and 60s had very, very high rates of fertility and population growth. That is now reversed. Sri Lanka now has a fertility rate that is below replacement level. And this is going to have very serious consequences. Uh, it's already beginning to have some consequences. The dependency ratio, which had steadily declined for 30 years, uh, it sort of bottomed out around 2005, and it's on its way back up again. The third thing, international relations. Sri Lanka is a small, trade-dependent island nation that stands at a grand geopolitical fault line between two of the largest economies in the world. That's a great opportunity, but that's also very risky, and it has to be managed with great care. So those are what I would call three things, three big issues which Sri Lanka is not really in control of, but must deal with, because they are going to affect the future of development in very, very critical ways. And now I come on to three things that are much more in-house. There are much more things which Sri Lanka has to deal with. It's within Sri Lanka's control. And the first thing is the issue of governance and institutions. Sri Lanka needs, Sri Lanka deserves better governance and more effective institutions. This is not something that I'm making up. This is something that is widespread recognition. Many critical public institutions do not function as they should. And I would posit that there are four big problems that they have to consider and deal with. So the first is simply the issue of effectiveness. They have to deliver what they are there to do. And the second thing is a problem of over-politicization. The third thing is the issue of inclusion. And the fourth is that of accountability. And while I'm just on the issue of governance and institutions, I mean, I've been quite pessimistic. Let me also talk about something very optimistic, something very hopeful. Uh, Sri Lanka's RTI, the Right to Information, is something really fantastic that came about at the beginning of last year. Uh, its potential is, is beginning to be unraveled, and it is going to be a very important tool. So that was governance and institutions. The second thing which I think we have to bear in mind is another big elephant in the room. It's the issue of community relations. So the recent violence in Digana, in Ampara, they're all very unpleasant, very difficult reminders that the problem of ethnic violence did not start or did not end with the war. Physical insecurity has very, very expensive, very disproportionate effects. What I mean by that is violence can be quite cheap, but its impact is extremely expensive. It's much wiser to invest in preventing a conflict than to pay the very, very heavy price of having to clean it up and stop it later. And the third thing I want to leave you with, the last thing, is the issue of inequality. 
So the recent data, and this is some of the things we were talking about this morning in um, the class we had at the university. The recent data shows that although Sri Lanka has made very significant progress in poverty reduction in recent years, unprecedented, really impressive progress in the decade from 2002 to 2012, in the years since 2009, there has been an increase in inequality. Sri Lanka is, in fact, the only country in the region that has had an increase in inequality since 2009. Now, I would just leave you with the idea that there needs to be much more attention to this, much more research, and much more policy attention into this. Inequality has many factors. It has all kinds of complicated and long-run effects. Uh, it's manifest not just in terms of uh, consumption, which is how it's typically measured uh, through, the, uh, through the data, but it's also, for example, evident in terms of health or education. It's evident in terms of the growth of the private provision of health and education, which people who can afford access, and which is then going to have lifelong generation long um, consequences. And the sort of the long, um, you know, sort of stasis, the underfunding the, of, of the public sector uh, in terms of health and education provision. So I leave it at that. I talked about um, the larger issues, which are climate change, demography, and international relations, which were outside the country's control, and the, those that are inside the country's control much more, which is the issues of governance and in institutions, community relations, and inequality. So I leave it at that. Thank you. So we'll move straight on to, to you uh, for your remarks, and, um, and then we'll go down the line. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. <laughs> OK, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dulani Sirisena, program manager at the Australian High Commission in Colombo. So I've been given the topic of working with non-traditional partners or working in non-traditional partnerships for development impact. How I thought I'd approach this is to talk a little bit about why we need to work in non-traditional partnership modalities now, what's changing about the context. I'll then go on to talk a little bit about what the Australian government has done around the region. Um, we have a few examples in Sri Lanka as well, which I will bring forward. And then I'll go on to talk a little bit about the risks and challenges of these approaches. So first of all, when you talk about non-traditional partners or working in non-traditional partnerships for development, um, the context has changed so much over the last decade or 15 years. ODA, or Overseas Development Assistance, is no longer the main source of financing for development. It's also not a big part of the economies of developing countries. Um, and private financial flows and remittances have really gone up, and these are now the main sources that can be tapped for development. So also, this is something that's really relevant to middle-income countries like Sri Lanka. When we look at the aid flows coming in that have reduced, and now we need to look at other ways of tackling development problems. So in that sense, when you look at those issues as well as the scale and complexity of the issues that now come up, there's no one partner who can find a solution to the problem. So it has to be a collaboration between government, between the private sector and civil society. And often, there are different things that these partners bring to the table, which can be mobilized to give us solutions to some of the development issues we are tackling, like what the, the professor mentioned earlier, climate change issues and, and so on. Um, when you look at the numbers, it's, it's quite interesting because when you define it broadly, the private sector in developing countries actually provides, on average, 60% of the GDP comes from the private sector, 80% of capital flows into developing countries come from the private sector, and 90% of the jobs. So that is a huge resource base that could be mobilized to tackle some of our development challenges. Um, it's interesting that the notion of working with the private sector is still considered 
new or emerging because the private sector has been around for a while and they have as part of their work been tackling development challenges in various ways for the last you know, couple of decades at least. But what we have found shifting is the approach. So what started off maybe as corporate philanthropy where businesses go in to do something good for the communities they work in because it helps them work in those communities now has cha changed more towards sort of, okay, corporate social responsibility, which again is not part of their core business, but is still aligned with their business strategies. But what we're seeing now over the last, say, four or five years is that it's moving further along the spectrum to this concept of shared value, uh, the concept that businesses can deliver sustainable social impact while also achieving their commercial returns. So this concept of shared value is interesting for the Australian government because this is the cornerstone of the um, strategy that came out in 2015, announced by our foreign minister, Julie Bishop, on engaging with the private sector in aid and development. So what we try to do is really look at where these this area of um, shared value really comes through. So when you look at the private sector, okay, their uh, motivation or their interest is to look at sustainable, profitable growth and uh, sustainable growth, um, sorry, sustainable, uh, a sustainable market base in which to sort of conduct their business. Um, for the Australian government or the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which I represent DFAT, um, we are looking at sustainable, inclusive uh, solutions to development problems. So when the two intersect, that middle area is where we find shared value. And that is where we invest um, a lot of our sort of funding and technical support and things like that to engage with the private sector to tackle development issues. Uh, OK, sure. Um, I might go on to talk a bit about some of the examples. I'm happy to elaborate more during the discussion uh, session later on. We have a few examples here. So we've got something called a market development facility that looks at connecting with businesses along the tourism value chain and supporting small and medium businesses for development. Uh, we've been having a very successful partnership with the International Labor Organization, ILO, in the North for the last six or seven years, where they have played a role in convening and facilitating local private sector, that's a cooperative system, um, and supporting them to connect up with export businesses. So that's a really interesting model that has worked for us. Apart from that, we have the business partnership platform. And in Sri Lanka, we have one example, which is a partnership with the telco company Dialogue, looking at financial inclusion in the north of Sri Lanka. So I might leave it at that, because I can go on for a long time. Uh, but during maybe the Q&A session, I can give a few more examples. So I, I'm not sure, do you hear me? I was asked to make a, a short presentation on how to use foreign policy and international cooperation tools to enable development. And since I'm a bit lazy, I took what I know the best, and that's the way the EU is trying to do that. Um, also in relation to more specific examples here in Sri Lanka. Um, I think all of you uh, have heard about the sustainable development goals that were adopted by the UN in 2015. And uh, the challenge is now how to implement th these, these goals. This has triggered also a number of internal reflections at the level of the EU institutions. And when, when I say the, in the EU institutions, I'm talking not only of the European Commission, but also the European External Action Service, the Council of Ministers, and not to, to forget the European Parliament. This resulted last year in June, if my memory serves me well, in the adoption of an important paper called the New European Consensus on Development. 
What's the purpose of this framework paper? It is to uh, reflect on how to implement through the various instruments that we have, the funding instruments obviously, but also through a close cooperation with the member states of the European Union, including the UK, um, the objectives of the um, Sustainable Development Goals, but also to do this in, li in line with our foreign policy uh, objectives, which is something new. So you see there's a, 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 a try for the first time to combine foreign affairs policy matters with development objectives. We also have been trying through that paper to find how we could mutually cooperate better with the member states wherever we are in developing countries than we did before. So there's al it's also an effort to demonstrate the visibility of the Union not only through the, the traditional institutions but also through the, the, cl the close cooperation with our member states and their agencies on the spot. Um, what are the guiding principles of that paper and uh, how is this going to imp have an impact on our daily cooperation, for instance, in Sri Lanka? Very clearly, and you will not be surprised, there are a number of principles and values that will be guiding, that are already guiding the EU development action and more generally also the EU foreign policy. This means that we have to act in accordance to democracy, to the rule of law, universality of human rights, respect for human dignity, principles of equality and solidarity. These universal values and good governance are of course at the heart of the 2030 agenda. And I would like to focus on a few examples. I would like to start with the political dialogue. We believe that uh, what is taking place for the time being between the EU and the Sri Lankan government is a good example of such a dialogue. It, it takes in the shape of a regular high-level meeting where e every element of human rights are taken uh, together and are assessed very carefully. Why is this the case and why has the Sri Lankan government accepted to do that? Because in the context of the policy dialogue, we are also looking at the implementation of the GSP plus measures, where we have been granting very favorable measures for exports of Sri Lankan products. In return, the Sri Lankan government has accepted to enter into such a political dialogue to see also how they are implementing progressively 27 international conventions. Some of them are more related to environment issues, the focus, uh, the main focus is nevertheless on human rights conventions and also on labor rights. So um, there is a combination from the EU side on the ut utilization of a number of tools. The foreign, in instrument, uh, the foreign policy instrument tool, as I mentioned, through that political dialogue. The use of, a t of, our, of our trade policy through the GSP+. Plus but also, obviously, through the implementation, the translation into concrete development projects of these human rights issues that we want to defend. In other words, uh, you will not be surprised that, for instance, in agreements, development agreements that we have with the African ACP countries, if there's a country not respecting human rights, there's a possibility to suspend the development aid. So this is not just about hypothetical possibilities. It's about a kind of trigger. If this is not respected, we stop the cooperation or we suspend the cooperation because we also realize that since we are working with a lot of international partners, this is the case, for instance, also here with Sri Lanka, uh, maybe that's an element that I would like to highlight. Unlike other member states of the European Union, the EU delegation as such in, in no part of the world our own implementation agency for development projects. So we are using either the member states agencies, we are unfortunately not having many of these here in Sri Lanka, except the Agence Française de Développement. De Most of them have gone, unfortunately, because of the fact that now Sri Lanka is no longer a developing country, but considered to be a middle-income country. So they have lost a lot of agencies, unfortunately. So we are also relying very much on our UN agencies' partners, 
Uh, and I would say that this is a very fruitful partnership. So it's a good example also of how the EU is trying to promote a number of priorities that are linked to the political priorities of this government. Two examples. One is obviously more of uh, a political nature. We have inserted in our priorities, in the EU priorities, for what we are doing in Sri Lanka, the, uh, a new sector in our uh, funding possibilities, and that's about democratic dialogue, democratic governance, to be more precise, and reconciliation, very much at the heart of what this government is intending to do, and it's not by accident that we are wanting to support them. I see that my time is up. The second element that I wanted to mention is, in terms of priority, the agricultural uh, area, where we feel that since this is still the backbone of this economy, we need to push forward uh, through various means. You mentioned the private-public uh, type of partnership, but there are other means that we are trying to explore. For instance, the European Investment Bank is looking at certain activities more in relation to sustainable development goals, environment, but also water uh, issues. Thank you very much. I'm ready to answer and to develop things uh, at the later stage. Thank you very much. I think um, so far, we're sort of halfway through, we've had um, a very broad laying out of, of the, a lot of the relevant issues uh, by Rajesh. Um, and we've heard two interventions about different kinds of definitions of shared values. I think it, it, we're talking about shared values defined in very different ways. Um, and when we get to the discussion, I think it'll be good to see if we can link some of the issues, say, about agricultural policy with what Rajesh was saying about climate change um, and, uh, and so on. So, you know, we're building towards something and we look at the interconnections um, as we go along and when we come into the discussion. But before I hand over um, uh, to um, Sonali Dairatna, uh, may I welcome Dr. Kumaraswamy for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for making it. Uh, we left you the final slot uh, just to give you some time to settle in and, and uh, listen to the others. So we have three more speakers before you, sir. Okay, thank you. You've got time. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the topic that has been allocated to me is effective socii uh, civil society engagement and how it can contribute to more impactful development. Um, essentially, es uh, evidence suggests that most countries that have effective uh, democratic forms of government involves considerable civil society engagement uh, that goes beyond just the use of the franchise. Um, these countries feature in the top 20 of the Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index, uh, which takes into account life expectancy, education, and income. In Sri Lanka, there has, however, been more ad hoc engagement of civil society in policy and lawmaking processes, which is largely elite-centric or Colombo-centric. However, meaningful civil society engagement in development processes is yet to be institutionalized or systematized into our governance. That having been said, uh, the constitutionally recognized right to information, which Rajesh referred to a little while ago, uh, that right, for instance, is a valuable tool uh, for citizens to ensure the impact of development processes reaches them such as quality service delivery in education and health. Citizens' involvement in development processes such as policy or lawmaking, um, in planning, in budgeting, in monitoring implementation by government is imperative for ensuring that these processes meet the context-specific needs and interests of people on the ground who may otherwise be excluded from the circle of administrative or political influence. It is also a means, as you know, to achieve the 2030 development agenda, uh, the, the main objective of which is to leave no one behind. Um, also, uh, one point I would like to make is that for citizens' in involvement to be effective, there has to be far more meaningful decentralization, which goes beyond how it is understood and practiced in Sri Lanka. If the impact of develop 
development processes are to reach those who are marginalized and excluded, there would need to be far greater authority and responsibility for designated functions transferred from the central government to local governments, communities, and the private sector. What is civil society? So turning to the definition of civil society, um, I would just like to uh, use uh, a Sri Lankan political economist definition, uh, Sunil Bastian, who has analyzed civil society as having at least two elements, one sociological and then the other political. Sociologically, it is a voluntary association that lies between the state and basic components of society, such as family and kinship groups. There is also a political dimension, which entails interactions and contestations over interests, values, and beliefs, as well as ideas. So therefore, civil society is seen as a social space where contradictory social forces are at play. Civil society consists of diverse forces and organizations. And so one can't assume that the involvement of civil society is always a positive. There could also be negative consequences. So much would depend on whether the interests and positions that civil society take are in the overall public interest. So then this brings me to the question of civic consciousness, um, of citizenry at large, which essentially makes up civil society. And one of the things I would like to point out is our education system, uh, which plays a large role in inculcating civic consciousness. And um, in my opinion, and also as uh, was um, sort of brought out through UNDP's 2014 uh, National Human Development Report on Youth. Um, what that report revealed is that education is mostly perceived by society um, a as a means of social mobility. And it's less about inculcating social values and civic mindedness. So I think that uh, we, we need to move to a place where, where essentially there has been long years of advocacy around uh, revisiting our education system, inculcating a value system in our education. And I think we need to move, move to that, uh, that place where essentially then members of civil society can play a, a fuller role uh, in the country's development process. Um, I think I've come to the end of my time, so I'll stop at this. Thank you. It's worth saying that uh, we, sh we should come back in the discussion to talking about civil society, where, um, talking about young people, where the lack is actually felt. Because certainly, you know, the masterclass we had this morning, the critique of the World Bank report on poverty in Sri Lanka was a fascinating discussion where uh, I didn't see any lack of civic mindedness. So it'll be quite interesting to here, where, um, why this anxiety about uh, youth and, and civic sense? But we can talk about that, and maybe some young people want to par be part of that conversation later. So um, can I now hand over to you and, and uh, for your remarks? All right, Thank yep. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the, the topic given to me was, where does the private sector fit in the development of Sri Lanka and its contribution to the regional agenda, and also the global forum. So the short answer to this is, yes, there is a, a role for the private sector to play, and it has to have a huge impact. But as one of my co-panelists mentioned a while back, there has, something, there has to be something that changes, and this is the mindset. Um, companies nowadays should take a look at the challenges that we all face in the community and in the markets that we operate in not as problems to be solved, but really as opportunities to actually grow our business further. So we have challenges called um, dwindling natural resources, climate change, inequality, um, and also a dwindling earth. So why not take a look at it from a different perspective where we should source our raw materials, our uh, packaging materials in a sustainable manner. We should also go for sustainable livelihoods, and we should also go for um, 
ensure that women actually get a fair deal, to ensure that the planet that we actually live in today is there for the next generation. So at Unilever, we actually make sure that uh, we believe that at this point in time, the companies that address both the needs of the environment and the citizens will actually prosper in the long term. One simply cannot decouple profitability or growth from sustainability at this point in time. Um, a lot has changed in the past 10 to 15 years. Consumers nowadays are more attuned to buying products that are sustainably sourced. They're even willing to pay a higher price for these types of products. So the business case is actually there. There's a case to be made. In Unilever's um, um, scenario, there's no doubt in our mind. Um, a while back, it was mentioned that CSR was there. We don't have CSR at this point in time. So we don't have a CSR facility or a CSR function. What we have is actually a shared value in terms of doing good by simply doing well. Um, and, you know, because it's our people who are so engaged with all of this, there's no need for a function to actually drive all of this. So the business should have a purpose, should have a shared value with the employees that it, it has and it cultivates. And at the same time, make sure that we do well by simply doing good. Um, in terms of the business case, in Unilever, 50% of our growth globally is generated by brands with a sustainable lens. And it is delivering 60% of our growth ahead of the whole company. The trust factor that we actually develop amongst not only our employees, but also for the people that actually want to get into Unilever is at an all-time high. We measure this through um, surveys in 60 countries that we recruit in. And one of the main reasons why they actually want to join a company like Unilever is because of its sustainability practices. Are we avoiding costs? Yes, we are because of sustainable practices, not only in our factories, but in the way we operate the business at this point in time. So there is indeed a business case to be had for sustainability and for making sure that we do play a part in the development of the country agenda for Sri Lanka. Now, how do we do this? Um, you know, one organization can't do this alone. But if we don't start within ourselves and within the organizations that we, that we work for, then nothing will actually happen. We also believe in the saying that um, small actions make a big difference. So start in your own way, and um, from time to time, we can see that other organizations, once they realize the impact of uh, sustainable business, they will really follow. Just like last year, we had, together with the UNDP, actually called for um, a private-public partnership dialogue where um, we try to mobilize collective action in order to address the priority SDGs of the country. So uh, there is clearly a, uh, a case for it, and hopefully everyone gets on the bandwagon before it's too late. Because keep this in mind, if we don't change, we can become irrelevant. Consumers have moved. We should also move in the private sector. So I'll, I'm willing to take questions later on. Hi, um, this is working, I hope. Um, so I was given the task of looking at the environmental implications and how to find an integrated approach where in environment is protected at the same time as development occurs. And what I started looking at was how significant was environment in the development and you know, we are called a tropical paradise. We are, the Sri Lanka is considered uh, one of the most di bio biodiversity hotspots in the world. Uh, it's called for global and national significance and importance. Um, flora, fauna, we have the environment itself is, is uh, crucial, especially because we are an island and we're very much dependent on the water and the land, that, the precious land that we have for the development purposes. So that's wonderful. But at the same time, while I do agree with you, we have to have a positive outlook, we have been designated number five in the in, uh, marine litter, littering of the marine, the sea around us. There's supposed to be 1.5 tons, metric tons of garbage, basically not garbage, like polythene, uh, surrounding us at this moment. 
So you can imagine that we have been designated as this, and as we progress more and more towards development, uh, it's going to get worse. So what do we do? We can look at laws. We have had laws since, I think, 1848. Timber laws, yes, but still, it's about environment, protection, forestry, and such. If you look at the ancient times, we've had even more. If you look at um, Vipavansa, Mahavansa, Parakram Baha, all these kings of old, you can give great examples of how they protected the environment whilst advancing the technology at that time. So the laws are there. We have more than 10 policies on environment. We have a ministry which is directly under the president. We have an environmental authority. We have uh, acts, regulations, but we still get Mitha Tumulla example. We still have Umawe example. So what do we do? How do we uh, look at an integrated approach? And I was pondering about that, and um, I felt that we, uh, I'm, my area is more about, it is environment, but it's also conflict resolution and conflict analysis. And I was thinking of, well, there is a, there's a concept or an approach called dip, uh, multi-track diplomacy, where you get a lot of different entities to be involved in the process. Uh, the media, the civil society, the youth, the, the business sector, the government, uh, everybody getting together and being a part of it. And has there ever been a success like that? Uh, one example I found was in the 1990s, early 1990s, when Kandalama uh, Resort came into existence, or the plan came into existence, uh, it was at a very crucial catchment area uh, in the uh, water reservoir. And people, youth, university youth, uh, environmental specialists, academics, they were very concerned and they were pressuring the government who had given okay to the business sector to build this building to stop this process. And because of that whole pressure, the, the Kandalama, the heritage Kandalama now, but Kandalama at that time made a promise, the business sector made a promise to make sure that it was ecologically friendly, that they would provide ways to prevent the waste from going forth into the water, the precious water which was needed for farming and the, and the villages. There were social issues as well, but predominantly eco uh, environmental. So I was, so this is a good example of where there's an integrated approach. You let the development happen, but at the same time, find a means of protecting the environment. And I think another example is the megapolis that is going to happen. It's a massive project um, where you have industrial sectors, you have different zones, but they have zones for three zones set aside for environmental protection. Um, the Matugam area, that whole area, that's a large area that they're intentionally leaving green so that that becomes like an absorbent of for the whole area. So that their intention was to incorporate development, but at, let it go hand in hand with environment friendly approach. You have to have the environment, but then development is crucial also for a country like Sri Lanka. So again, I, I'd be happy to have ask uh, for uh, questions later. <laughs> Um, good afternoon. I think the theme I've been asked to speak on is frameworks for policy making. Is that right? Yeah. So um, what I'm proposing to do is to uh, divide my remarks into two. One is to talk about frameworks for macroeconomic policy making, and two in terms of measures to strengthen the growth framework within the country. On the former, um, as you all probably know, Sri Lanka has been a pretty typical twin deficit country, that is, a country with an unsustainable budget deficit much of the time and a country with an unsustainable current account or the balance of payments much of the time. So that is a caricaturization of the economy over many years now. So what is being done to get the country out of this uh, grouping of, uh, of nations? So on the macroeconomic policy making side, there are four frameworks that are being put into place. 
Historically, the main source of instability, macroeconomic instability in the economy has been the government's fiscal operations. If one were to caricaturize the Sri Lankan economy since its liberalization in 1977, it has been a high budget deficit, high inflation, high nominal interest rate, uh, overvalued exchange rate economy. And that is diametrically the opposite of what the successful countries of East and Southeast Asia have been. Those countries ran tight budgets. They were able to maintain low inflation, which enabled them to have low and stable interest rates, which enabled them to have uh, often an undervalued and stable currency. But Sri Lanka needs to get there. And the, arguably the most important um, challenge in terms of uh, strengthening our macroeconomic fundamentals is to ensure that we have fiscal consolidation. So the country has embarked upon uh, a trajectory of fiscal consolidation, which is expected to bring the budget deficit down to 3.5% of GDP. And if we get there, that is a deficit that can be financed without too much trouble, without uh, incurring unsustainable debt. And as part of that process, uh, what the government is considering is to strengthen its fiscal rules. At the moment, there is a Fiscal Management Responsibility Act, which has certain targets, but those targets completely lack teeth. The idea is to now give the act greater teeth, whereby the deviation from those targets can only be for certain specific reasons, like uh, relief uh, after a natural disaster or uh, counter-cyclical fiscal policy to counter a severe recession caused by a an exogenous shock. So there would be specific reasons when you could deviate from those targets. And even when you do, you've got to set out how you're going to come back into alignment. So those are the fiscal rules that have been considered, which I hope will be put in. And I hope that the government will be able to continue on the uh, path of fiscal consolidation it has embarked upon. The second framework relates to monetary policy. Historically, we've had a lot of fiscal forbearance. Basically, monetary policy accommodated the loose fiscal policy. But now we are moving to a flexible inflation targeting regime. Uh, I can develop it further if anybody wants to during the discussion. But the idea is to have a framework which is forward-looking and which is proactive and which has legal and accountability frameworks which build in greater independence for the central bank, but there will also be more accountability in terms of delivering price stability. The third framework uh, relates to the exchange rate. Uh, Sri Lanka has tended to try to have a very dirty float to try to defend an overvalued currency by using its reserves, uh, and it has never worked. We spend uh, often billions of dollars of our reserves to try to uh, defend the currency, and in the end, we have to depreciate by a sharp, large amount anyway. So it's a, it's a no-brainer. You get a kind of double whammy of losing your reserves and having to depreciate anyway. So the policy now is not to intervene in the market to try to defend the rate. Uh, we are intervening the market to purchase dollars to build up non-borrowed reserves, but we don't use up reserves to defend, defend the uh, currency anymore. And uh, it's much more market determined. And we are also uh, trying to develop some rules for intervention in the market so that there is transparency and predictability as to the actions of the central bank in the exchange, foreign exchange market. The fourth framework relates to, uh, the, um, to liability management. It's no secret that Sri Lanka is an outlier in terms of its debt dynamics amongst its rating peers. So in order to manage that, we've just got the Liability Management Act passed in Parliament, which enables us now to have greater headroom. Historically, the borrowing in any given year was limited to the borrowing requirement of the government budget only. So you couldn't borrow extra to build up buffers to manage your debt. So again, I can expand upon it. My time is up. But the Fiscal Responsibility Management Act, sorry, the um, Liability Management Act gives us the headroom and flexibility to manage our debt going forward. It means that the maturity structure, the interest rate structure are no longer fixed anymore. We can manage it by various techniques, which I'm happy to expand upon uh, uh, during the discussion. And on the growth side, I've run out of time, but essentially there are, uh, the growth framework is being strengthened through work to improve investment climate, investment promotion, trade facilitation, trade policy, all those, there are,
programs to improve the growth framework. Up to now, growth has been very muted because while we've had some success in stabilizing the economy, uh, the, the growth impetus in the economy has not picked up as much as it could have done because the uh, structural reforms have perhaps not progressed as quickly as they could have done. Though they are moving in the right direction, we had a record year for exports, a record year for FDI last year from very low basis, but still moving in the right direction. So we need to persist and persevere, both on the macro side and in terms of strengthening the growth framework. Sorry, I've overrun. Thank you, thank you very much. Before I uh, uh, throw open uh, the discussion to the floor, can I just remind uh, for all of you on Twitter that the hashtag for this event is uh, hash CDD. I think that's the, is that right? Where are the organizers? Is that the, uh, so please feel free to tweet live um, uh, about the event as we uh, proceed. And if you see me on my phone, that's all I'm doing. I'm, I'm just uh, live tweeting from here. So um, we've invited uh, four or five uh, discussants to speak to get the ball rolling. We've heard five, six very diverse uh, viewpoints, uh, different areas of speciality, uh, different kinds of themes, the environment, uh, shared values of different sorts, the role that the private sector can play, macroeconomic policy being set. And we need to, we're going to try and tie these together. And to help us do this, uh, I'm going to invite first uh, to speak um, Dr. Dushni Birakun. Uh, to start uh, the discussion. And there should be a microphone coming to you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, in some sense, I'm glad that uh, at the outset you said uh, you're experimenting with this policy dialogue. Because listening to uh, seven, eight different voices <laughs> on very, very... Uh, diverse topics, I kind of mix, miss the integrated development impact that was sort of the overarching theme of this um, uh, Colombo Dialogue, as I understand. Um, my um, main concern really is that, um, I mean, each of the speakers came up with one or two points that I think um, pinpoint the core problems that Sri Lanka faces in terms of its demographics, in terms of its in geographic location that leads to um, its losing control of, over its uh, destiny to some extent. The fact that there is rising inequality, and um, as Dr. Kumaraswamy very rightly said, uh, we are bottoming out on growth. We have a huge debt overhang, so macro problems. Um, on top of all of that, and to address the economic, social, and environmental challenges, we don't have an integrated framework. And that comes back to something that I think um, Dr. Venugopal mentioned, the uh, weak institutional structures that uh, we are currently um, grappling with. And in that context, to me, uh, going forward for Sri Lanka, with its demographics, with its narrow growth base, um, the obvious signals, the signs are that we are going to see rising inequality um, because of the nature of the Sri Lankan demographics. It is that we are moving out of agriculture, industry into services, um, which the education system has really not equipped the workforce to gear up for that in that process. Um, and with all those challenges, um, we simply are not prepared to meet the sustainable development challenges in, in, in the broadest terms. It can be looked at, as um, she mentioned, an environment, megapolis, you know, but it just, just doesn't um, hang together. So I uh, will stop with my um, observation 
Um, the first speaker said that Sri Lankans tend to be a rather pessimistic lot, but I think that is quite understandable. Um, the point that you missed is that in the 1960s, you said Sri Lanka has lots of things to be proud of. We achieved all of that in the 1960s and were well ahead of East Asian countries. So it's, it's the time since um, that we've slipped, and when you look at how far we've slipped, um, I think it is uh, quite understandable that as a nation, we tend to be um, always harping on about uh, missed opportunities. So I am going to um, stop at that. Thank you very much. Um, it is a pessimistic note to end on, and I think the pessimism is widely shared, and, and the optimism is presumably in trying hard to join the dots and to create some sort of integrated thinking, which we hope will be an outcome of this discussion rather than uh, pre-built into the design of the event itself. But hopefully this will um, emerge. Can I call, uh, call upon Professor Ajit uh, D. Alvis uh, to make his remarks? Thank you. Uh, uh, just to uh, start off with the panelist, um, I was asked to comment on the word innovation process of innovation, which I think is a key uh, for critical development. I mean, we all now should consider, and the rest of the world and everybody considered this as a critical driver in development and well-being for any country. But I didn't hear the, any of this word at all mentioned by none of the panelists, right? Even though we talked about the development in many facets and uh, the issues, but kind of even looking at a solution, a way forward, we didn't bring this word nor did we mention the science and technology a bit. I understand it from this, but uh, I just want to stress it because it's very, very important to think the potential of innovation, uh, the innovation-led development, and it's happening right across. And um, so I think it needs to be factored in, in the discussion, if you had to move forward, because development sends, uh, uh, with this mindset, uh, it will be very difficult with the challenges because uh, one speaker mentioned about, I think it's, uh, uh, it was mentioned about the one elephant, uh, Rajesh, I think it's mentioned about climate change, but I think there are another eight other elephants that if you look at really the planetary boundaries, uh, we seem to be crossing. And uh, climate change, yes, but in addition to climate change, even with nitrogen and phosphorus, we seem to have been issues that have been very quantitatively improving. So we should know that when you talk about nine billion people on planet uh, coming up in the next uh, decades, uh, that's a very tough call if we try to use the same type of solutions that we are trying to uh, use for the future. So we need to have a different mindset. We need to think differently and creative. It's, I think, it's an imperative, right? And uh, so in that note, maybe the Sri Lankan government, and we see that uh, doing business gets a lot of attention. Trying to correct the WB World Bank Index on the doing business index, and we spend quite a lot of effort on those 11 uh, sectors. But to me, the question is, why not we look at the Global Innovation Index, the 80-odd parameters, much wider, much broader, much more. There's lots more to take from if we concentrate on GII instead of the world business. Yes, it's nice. You can see the Modi government in India uh, jumped across 30 places uh, this year, 2016 to 17. Um, it's, it gives it um, quite positive achievement. But remember, with the, uh, the Make in India, uh, the government has there emphasized on uh, the manufacturing, the innovation, etc., and intellectual property, right? So even though we consider ourselves Sri Lanka now or maybe a middle-income country, our innovation ecosystem is almost like a low-developed country uh, innovation ecosystem, with the partnerships between industry and universities, right? And I would say, as a fact, maybe when we teach today students in uh, University of Moratua or any other for that matter, I suppose we, uh, through that teaching, we serve different economies better than our own economy. Um, so I think that we have to take it as a fact, right? Our students are lost almost immediately. So they learned with the resources within, but they serve well within a different, uh, different economy simply because the system of engagement is much better and much different. So we need to understand that the human, human capital loss is significant, and we should factor that, how to, how to retain human capital by providing the, uh, the, the societal change that is needed. 
So in the same context, uh, I see that R&D, the new tax policy and so on, it's again mentioned, how do you drive these things? Even if you take a country like United States, you have small business grants, where you give free grants and expect the taxing, taxes to get strength in the economy. You don't see collateral or you don't think anything, you, look, you look, give grants for SMEs and uh, they work on it. And why not, uh, even Singapore will give 400% uh, tax rebates on certain parts. But we find the, our R&D tax part is pretty poorly defined and not significant at all. So we don't seem to stress on these sectors at all. Even though we understand well the issues that are facing us, our solution mindset is not, have not factored in the real way of moving forward to solutions. It's just a comment, maybe discuss further. Um, need to correct on one thing on Dr. Manish, I think. Um, yes, unfortunately, we have got branded into a plastic polluter on the marine side. But this is something another institution of us should have addressed because this journal article appeared on a prestigious journal Science. Um, I think all of us, all of them will believe that rather than our Department of Information. Um, so the point is to become much clearer on quantitating this, quantifying this. I think the reference for that discussion, that paper is wrong. So unfortunately, Sri Lanka has gone up in that. So let me, so going from the policy aspects to some of those quantitative aspects, we need to dig deep. It's, I'm not being pessimistic. I think innovation is a fantastic leveler. We have the opportunity to be creative and then change the game very quickly if we really position ourselves, focus ourselves to do that. Thank you. Uh, can I invite uh, Ms. Smriti Daniel uh, to make her remarks? Hi, uh, thank you so much for that. I'm here speaking a little bit from the perspective of media and journalists and so I wanted to say, just kind of take a few minutes to talk about the challenges of reporting on development. So all over the world, I mean, we're seeing issues like poverty are underreported, and simultaneously we're seeing studies um, that tell us that people are staying away from the news because they find it kind of overwhelmingly negative. Um, and I think we in the industry are right to worry that our style of reporting is, you know, in, endangering, I mean, kind of engendering, sorry, apathy in people and that we're, we're not doing this right in some ways because we're not communicating uh, effectively on some of the most serious issues that we're facing today. Um, so one thing that's interesting to me is to kind of see movements that are rising up to kind of address this. One of them is this idea of constructive um, journalism, you know, which editors at publications like the BBC, The Guardian, and The Economist are becoming more interested in. Um, so constructive journalism is solution-focused. Uh, and I think it actually responds, you know, in fact, I think there was a survey um, by, the, by the BBC World Service that showed 64% of under 35s want news that includes solutions to problems, not just news that tells them about certain issues. Um, so where does that leave us as journalists? I think we have to strive to be critical and balanced uh, rather than sensational and controversy driven. Uh, through our reporting, we have to broaden the democratic debate to encompass not just what the issue is, but how to resolve it. Uh, we have to present people not as passive victims, but as the active participants that they really are. And then as journalists, we also have to find ways to collaborate with people we never have before, uh, producing content in you know, partnerships with uh, tech, multimedia, or product specialists even. And as development practitioners, uh, you can support quality journalism by collaborating with journalists. And I know this is sometimes more challenging. Um, you know, it, it can be quite difficult, I think, because sometimes there is a, a deep distrust between these two groups. Um, but I think these collaborations can be really valuable. Uh, to give just one instance, you know, through your research, you can critically examine and evaluate uh, how well a development project has functioned, in a sense, identifying the difference between the impact on people as claimed and as it actually is. Uh, new solutions can and have in, uh, emerged from such collaborations, and I'd like to see more of those. And so essentially, just to wrap up, when we are thinking about communicating the SDGs, about human-centric development, um, when we want to engage and inspire people, I think then we need to be willing to challenge traditional ways of communicating and show people possibilities. Um, also, thank you to the panel for those fascinating comments. They were very broad, and I agree with Dr. Dushni that I, I didn't see the integration coming through there so much. But I do have questions, and for me, of course, it would be really interesting to see, for instance, Dr. Kumaraswamy 
respond to Dr. Venugopal's you know, uh, comments on um, inequality, for instance, or uh, I think it was Dr. Manisha respond on climate change and so on. Uh, but just a few questions. Uh, Dr. Venugopal, you said poverty is under, you know, we were talk you were talking about poverty as an issue and uh, this idea of it being underreported in media across the world. I wanted to talk to ask you, you know, how you think that can be addressed. What are the flaws you see in reporting around poverty and inequality? And how do you think we can get people more interested? Uh, Ms. Sirisena, how can we sustainably fund long-term integrated development programs? How must funding models change to support this? Um, the EU ambassador mentioned experiments in combining foreign policy matters with development objectives. Do you have reservations about this approach? Uh, what are the risks you have identified? Mr. Cruz, I was glad to hear you say we cannot decouple profit or growth from sustainability. And I was struck by your comment that it was one of the biggest draws when you are recruiting new employees. Would you elaborate on that? How do you incorporate a focus on sustainability across your organization? What are the big challenges in making this transition for companies such as yours? Um, and just a final question. Um, what communication strategies can be used to raise awareness around issues like littering? Uh, what are some of the most successful strategies, perhaps those adopted by other countries, that can be used to change attitudes and shift behaviors here? Thank you. This is why we need journalists to ask really pointed questions. Thank you for those uh, very much, Smriti. Um, I'd like to call upon my colleague, Dr. Nilanjan Sarkar from LSE to, uh, to ask, to make his comments and ask a question. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Ah, thank you very much, everyone. I have had the advantage of being involved in the planning of, of this uh, panel discussion. And I, my, my job gives me the peculiar advantage of being able to hear similar discussions across countries in the region. And I'm struck by the commonality of vocabulary in what all of you have said and its resonance in other countries of the region. The reason I began with saying, so, so you know, things like sustainability, about governance structures, about community relations, um, about uh, civil society participation, non-traditional partnerships, policies not having teeth, even pessimism. And my question is that there, what is very interesting when these sorts of uh, dialogues happen is that the framing device of, of these dialogues is that we are on the one hand looking at global issues, sustainable development goals that have been set at a global level. There are regional issues, commonalities, resonances, and then there are domestic issues which are always specific. If we want to look at an integrated approach, is there anything that we can think of, and my question is to each of you, is there anything that we can think of that if wishes were horses for you, you would do that is completely out of the box and yet you think is possible within the particular context of Sri Lanka? Thank you. And uh, our final discussant uh, is Mr. Ruchik Gandagi. If I know he hadn't arrived, is he here? Yes, I'm here. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm here to discuss on the private-public partnership space and the policy framework and the innovative funding mechanisms we are adopting to achieve our sustainable development objectives. Uh, on the uh, private public partnership space, uh, the policy framework uh, refers mainly to development of a sustainable strategic and uh, transparent procurement guidelines uh, based on the 1998 uh, procurement guidelines and adopting it to the current global practices and uh, what is prevailing in our country. And uh, su substantial progress has been made during the past four years, uh, well, sorry, past four months. And uh, now we are at the process of uh, engaging the key stakeholders in the public sector 
to uh, guide us in this development process. And it's an iterative process, and we hope we'll be able to uh, sort of uh, uh, finalize the procurement policies soon. So that will give us a transparent, clear, predictive process in implementing private-public partnerships. That's one. The second thing is, uh, a lot of you mentioned about the private-public partnership and sustainable development goals. And in order to do all these things, we require significant funding. And there are innovative ways of searching and locating the funding to implement this private-public partnership. That is also a key area of my organization. And what we have seen is when you are mixing the private sector and the public sector, there is a cost of capital premium we pay for the efficiencies and the management capabilities and the rest of the things in the public uh, private sector. But since you are implementing uh, a socially motivated pro projects and other area in, in areas of socially motivated uh, projects, the ability to uh, ability and the flexibility to do uh, the uh, to have a pricing strategy or the sculpturing of the revenue is limited. So when you have that, the private sector will not invest large amounts of money or the capital because the returns are lower than their expected uh, returns. So, we have found a. A, a, a new innovative solution called viability gap funding, which we are pursuing with many international development agencies as well as other partners, which will enable us to fund this uh, uh, develop, uh, sustainable development goal motivated projects within our country. So we are a very, very young uh, organization within the government of Sri Lanka. This is the fourth month of operation within that space and give us a little bit of more time. We hope we can make a difference in the private public space, uh, pub enterprise space in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Um, I'm going to invite the panelists to, uh, if, you're, if you'd like to respond uh, to any specific question, but just for a couple of minutes, because I do want to take uh, questions from the floor. I think, Rajesh, there were all of you had very directed questions uh, to you. So if you could just perhaps address those, not go into longer remarks so that we can take some more questions and we'll come back to you again. Uh, so Rajesh, do you want to start? Uh, we'll follow the same order that we spoke in. Uh, yes, I'm just going to respond to the question, the very interesting question on how do you get people more interested in reporting on poverty? Um, I mean, let me start by saying that I don't study this subject in the sense that I'm not, I don't know about the media or journalism as such. So, <clears throat> but let me just suggest that um, I think it's very hard. It's very hard because, as you said, people look for sensationalized stories. So where poverty sells, it is because of sensationalized poverty reporting. It's famine sells, um, scandals with charities where you know, people are supposed to be doing something, that sort of thing we often see. So, I think it's, it is really important to have reporting on poverty that is not some kind of an expose or a tragedy. Um, and I think that there are unfortunately very few ways in which uh, this can be done uh, and which it is done successfully. So from my experience, it's often at critical moments at which policy formulation is happening and when there is a national debate. For example, if we were to go into a next generation of Samurdi or some new poverty alleviation scheme was coming in and there was a policy debate that was vibrant I think there is really a critical role that the media has there in presenting information, in cultivating a debate, in promoting that, in presenting facts. So that is an example of where it could happen. Unfortunately, that's quite limited. That's at a time in which there is a certain greater degree of national attention towards something that is otherwise very unsexy. It doesn't sell. It's not really sensational. So I haven't really got an answer, but that's an example of, where, of, of how limited it is. I sympathize with that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Smriti, you raised the question around how um, uh, funding models have changed to respond to these issues that are coming up and, and how they can be more responsive to this environment. Um, interestingly, the Australian government has had a lot of support from the central level to be 
to, well, our risk appetite has increased a little bit, and we have certain policies in place that help us to take that risk. And so, for example, how we would have handled a certain problem earlier, say, five, 10 years ago, is through direct contracting with a partner. But now that has moved a little bit towards more collaborative approaches and longer term partnerships at institutional levels, which give us a lot more flexibility to A, to respond to the challenges, but also to the changes in the context. Because as you know, the Sri Lankan context is so dynamic, especially when we work in um, underprivileged areas, war affected areas, and so on. We've had to co-create solutions with our partners, and that's something we increasingly focus on. So. It hasn't been an easy um, um, road to this point, and a lot of sort of policies, practices have to uh, have to have changed along the way. Uh, but we have had that support from the central government, and that's continuing. So that's that's a positive sign for us. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to make a comment on what was said about the need to retain human capital. And I'm relating this more particularly to the youth uh, in this country, or rather the youth that is going to study abroad, um, sometimes and very often in, in, in very technical but interesting uh, sectors such as science and technology or engineering. And what, what is very striking is to, to listen at the stories and to hear that so many of these talented people who have got the diplomas and who could come back to this country and help to the development of this country, don't come. So the reason why they are not coming is a big question that needs to be answered, I think, uh, both by the public authorities to see how to encourage these people to, to come back to the country, but perhaps even more, I would say, by the private sector, how to attract them here in Sri Lanka, despite maybe lower salaries, but perhaps a uh, more interesting career path than in, 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 uh, in other countries where they would remain because of the stability and because of the comfort, the financial comfort. This is just a, a reflection, but I think it's an important one. If you don't manage to keep the people that have got the talents, that are Sri Lankans, to come back in, in their country and to work for their country and to develop their career here, you will have problems in the future. Perhaps I can just talk about, um, essentially there was a, a question raised about uh, the state of civic consciousness amongst young people. Um, the 2013-14 survey that we did Oil Island of over 3,000 young people, it was a representative sample survey, was that young people are actually interested in social issues and want to engage and address them. But um, this is still very much an older adult-led society. And, and that's reflected in our national parliament, in, in different tiers of decision making as well. And, and so there are certain obstacles to them engaging um, civically because uh, you know, the, the, the older adult-led society as well as their parents uh, put pressure on them to achieve certain goals which are around social mobility uh, and around employment. And, and whilst those may be important, uh, there is still this challenge in our education system which needs to balance that civic consciousness uh, which is required for, for the development of a country. And so I, I just like to make that point. Carl, I wonder whether you could, uh, uh, you know, tying these two things together, actually respond to the point made earlier about opportunities for young people in, in uh, different sectors. And also, I would like, uh, perhaps, Dr. Krupa Kumaraswamy, when you talk, to pick up uh, Ajit's point about innovation and the roadblocks to innovation and the financial structures that create roadblocks to innovation. I think that is one response to why young people are not coming back uh, to Sri Lanka to invest their energies here. So uh, you go first, please. It's all right. I'll respond to the um, question on how difficult it is to actually drive this kind of thinking in an organization such as Unilever. Um, we've been in this journey for about 10 years now. Um, in 2009, 2010, we started the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan kind of thinking. And it's been very difficult at the start. 
Now, one of the key success factors is really top management support, really from the top down. I've been with the company for about 26 years now, and when I first heard about this, I was quite skeptical. I said, what is this? This will not work. Um, but the minute you actually get top management breathing down your neck, taking a look at KPIs, scorecards in terms of the USLP, where we actually want to, one, um, improve the lives and well-being of a billion people globally by 2020, reduce our environmental impact by half, and uh, make sure that there is a sustainable um, agricultural sourcing and sustainable livelihood. So once you get these kinds of scorecards and once it enters the business discussion in the board meeting, then you realize that there is really some top-down support. Um, where are we right now? Um, I think Unilever was quite ahead of the game in identifying this kind of trend. Uh, at that time, in reference with the framework, there's no framework uh, that guided all of us, but we were able to actually look at the trend where consumers were willing to buy products sourced sustainably, where we looked at the trend where employees were clinging to or staying longer with companies who had the purpose. So it's, it's really there because if you don't adjust, then you will become disrupted. On the point of Dr. De Alves a while back in terms of innovation, I think very important in terms of R&D, especially um, science and technology, we can move leaps and bounds. But simple ways of working in, in terms of innovation will also work. For example, here in Sri Lanka, we have reduced, uh, not many people know, the number of working days for most of our field force um, from six to just five selling days. So a lot of people are actually surprised why we did this. And you'll be surprised by the impact of the productivity. It has improved dramatically. Because again, the people are more energized, they're not so tired. So this is, again, uh, an example for me of not much money or research is needed, but really looking at the employees themselves. So asking them to work instead of six, five days. Um, to the point of how are we able to recruit um, well by using sustainability and by retaining people well. Uh, we, our mat leave is about six months at this point in time. And we've had colleagues who have come to us and said, if not for the maternity leave of six months, I would have left Unilever. So that is one classic example. Um, we've had um, students from the university saying, because your brands like Lifeboy are all after hand washing to prevent diseases, we'd like to work for a company that manages these kinds of brands. So there is, you know, not only in terms of, um, you know, real money, but having a purpose, um, thinking of very innovative ways of working um, and, and making sure that we look at um, hard facts. For example, again, in terms of uh, gender equality, uh, one last. We make it a point whenever we are going to promote or to recruit, we always ask ourselves, is there a female colleague that is qualified? A simple question like that raises the awareness and it helps out in the end. Manisha, can I um, ask you to respond to the question about if you had a wish list of how, uh, it, how an integrated approach would be designed, what, what would it be like? Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to respond to that uh, question about the statistics uh, on the, the amount of litter around the island. I, I, I also found the, the numbers and the data very curious, but I assumed that that was because of the the ocean, the flow of the, the currents resulting uh, litter coming from other places, but we're, that we're still surrounded by it, but it's just that it is coming from other places. A uh, wish list is a bit of a problem. <laughs> um, I think we need uh, enlightened activists. That is where we have to have people who are uh, not just willing to stand back and wait for transparent to, to, to occur, but to question and ask and find out why this is happening, why do you do this, why did you have this here instead of there, please explain. Not violently, but uh, that's why enlightened uh, activists rather than uh, uh, violent or kind of pushy ones. But I would also like to add that about the litter, you know, teaching about litter, collecting litter and stuff. Um, we have informal, formal, non-formal education. We have 
cartoons, all of them present something completely different, violence and everything on TV. You can change that and find a good uh, role models for children to be interested in. You know, children watch Dora and all these other things because they present something very insightful. And um, so um, it, it is possible. I'm not sure about the adults, but with children, it is very uh, possible. And we, at the university, we have uh, we are trying to do uh, recycling, and students are slowly being interested in it. Uh, they sometimes dump it in the wrong one, but they're interested. On, on innovation and uh, technological progress, uh, I think um, it's instructive to look at the experience of the successful countries of uh, East and Southeast Asia. I wholly endorse uh, uh, Professor Diabis's uh, remarks. Um, you know, adaptation, adoption and adaptation of technology um, was a very key determinant of the success of these countries. And they had clear policy frameworks to support that, uh, which is something we have not done in a, in a coherent way. Um, and two other thoughts is if you also, when you, the empirical evidence suggests that often innovation within an economy is driven by foreign direct investment. And the fact that we have been very unsuccessful, really, in relation to the countries to the east of us in attracting FDI is another reason, I think, uh, why we have lagged as far as innovation and technological progress is concerned. And thirdly, it's the development of capital markets. You know, you need um, angel investors, venture capital, private equity, you know, up the chain uh, to support these uh, uh, startups. Having said that, there's a very interesting space in Sri Lanka. If you look at the IT startup community, it's very impressive. Um, in fact, there's a World Bank project, the Ministry of Development Strategies and International Trade, um, is it working with the World Bank. Uh, there's a project on, I think, innovation and entrepreneurship. It's called, it's just about ready, uh, and it will, um, I think the findings will be shared. But that's, so there is, there, is a, there is a kind of a model perhaps we should study as far as the IT sector is concerned and to see what has made it work uh, within, within this environment that we have. Can I also just pick up a couple of the other questions, the one on inequality uh, that was uh, spoken about. You know, clearly, it's a global problem. Uh, but to locate it in Sri Lanka, um, we uh, there are two levels at which I think we need to uh, operate and be conscious of. One is clearly the the um, the most effective way one can transmit the benefits of growth is to create higher and higher value livelihoods, um, and. For that, again, that ties into the technology story as well. Uh, plus, you've got to make sure that your education, training, and skills development is aligned with the new sectors, the new opportunities that are emerging as far as the dynamic comparative advantage of the country is concerned. So that's, that's at one level that you, you need to, uh, 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 you know, to attack inequality. Um, that you make you empower people on the one hand with education and training, and on the other hand, you need to have the the technological progress, the investment, etc., to create higher value jobs. Um, as far from a central banking perspective, just to say one thing uh, about inflation. You know, inflation is a highly regressive tax. Uh, it affects the poor far, far more disproportionately uh, than it does the wealthy. The poor don't have any assets which act as a hedge uh, uh, against inflation, um, uh, and uh, whereas the rich do have these assets which uh, you know, uh, increase in value. So from the central bank's perspective, the way we can contribute to containing uh, inequality is to make sure that uh, inflation is kept down. Final comment on out, an out-of-the-box thought. It's not really out-of-the-box, because I think people in Sri Lanka are thinking about it. Uh, but it's something we need to really be focused on and to see how best we can uh, take the best, uh, get the greatest advantage out of it. And that is the evolving dynamics of the 
geopolitics of the Indian Ocean region. Um, with the rapid expansion of China's Blue Water Navy, I think that's been a game changer. All, all the uh, major powers have had a renewed interest uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, so the question is, how do we develop uh, uh, a kind of a strategic promiscuity which enables us to take advantage of this renewed interest. Uh, um, I think Jane Austen had a, had a heroine called Penelope who, who um, had many um, uh, people who courted her but didn't allow anybody into the bedroom. So that's, that's what we need to do, to see how best we can leverage uh, this renewed interest in Sri Lanka to our advantage uh, while still uh, you know, retaining um, uh, certain um, uh, you know, sovereignty is an overvalued word in, in the modern, modern, modern context, but certainly while we are able to have a, a degree of control over our, de over our destiny, which is desirable. Thank you. Thank you, all the panelists, for, for being brief and, and responding to the questions. I think it would be safe to say at this point that um, so far, this has been an exercise like the first strike on the carom board. They've been, we know what the pieces are, we know where they're going to be, and we have, at the first track, we've scattered, we've raised all the different configurations, the different issues, the different positions that people would take on this. Uh, and now I think the effort with CDD, at least, is to go forward, is to actually look at specific sets of issues in far greater detail, perhaps work with Citra in uh, trying some of these ideas, testing them. Maybe one of them could be to have embedded journalists in development programs. I mean, we can, it's always worth trying and, and taking this forward. So I'm just stressing the point before I now invite your questions that uh, this is a first strike at raising the whole, a huge range of issues, not exhaustive, but a wide range of issues from macroeconomic policy uh, to environmental factors. And I now invite questions from the floor. Uh, please keep your questions very brief. Uh, we have just over half an hour to uh, have this Q&A. So if you can be kind enough to keep them brief, then we can get more questions in. So please raise your hand that microphone's traveling around. So uh, the gentleman in the, at the back there. Is this on? Hi, uh, this is a question for the governor. Would you uh, mind standing up so we can see you clearly? Thank you. Yes. This is a question for the governor. Uh, governor, um, recently over the last two years, we had an issue with growth. We are well below uh, the 6% six six uh, potential growth. Um, we are also having a situation where inflation is also tempered. Now you have, uh, as a government, we have two handles. One is the monetary, the other is the fiscal side. And you have the monetary lever on your hand. Um, do you think that we are too restrictive both on the monetary and the fiscal side? Um, and we are actually suffering on the growth side. Is it possible for the central bank to maybe be a little bit more aggressive um, and release that uh, leave a little bit more so that we can just nudge up that growth. Thank um, you. Thank you. I think you've made your point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's take another question and then we'll, we'll take two or three together. Uh, here in the front. Thank you. Um, I have uh, three questions uh, for individual panelists. Um, for Rajesh, the question is, has Sri Lanka's high level of human development been a blessing or a curse for its economic development. For Indrajit, um, is central bank independence important for flexible inflation targeting and macro stability? And the last question for the EU ambassador, is Sri Lanka's work in progress on rights, transitional justice, human rights, uh, a risk for us with the GSP plus and European aid? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you want to okay, do you want sure. to start? Yeah. I think um, first let me say that you know we increased, um, uh, rather we reduced the upper 
bound of the, uh, uh, the, the policy rate by 25 basis points uh, uh, just this morning. But it's a very, very good question. Um, you know, as I said, we have for years been a twin deficit economy. And that has largely been because we've had excess demand in the system. Uh, and having excess demand in the system is a little bit like being an alcoholic. And you need to go through cold turkey to come out the other side. So the, the fiscal consolidation and prudent forward-looking monetary policy is the cold turkey that we have to go through. But it's not enough to do those stabilization measures you have to have aggressive reform. The reason why our growth rate is so low is that, in my view, our economic reform has lagged the stabilization. You, ha you have to do both. Uh, it's when the economic reform process you know, lacks sufficient momentum, you don't, I mean, there will be a dip in growth for sure, but the kind of when you get a significant dip in growth is when the reform, progress has, reform process has not been as aggressive as it should have been. So in an ideal world, you know, you, you, when you're doing fiscal consolidation and, 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 and tightening monetary policy to go through that cold turkey, to get, squeeze inflationary expectations out of the economy, um, to have uh, you know, a balance of payments, current account deficit, which can be financed in a sustainable way without having a debt problem. While you're going through that, at the same time, you have to be very aggressive in terms of you know, increasing, product, increasing uh, uh, strengthening the growth framework, productivity improvements, technology, all the other stuff that has to be done, investment climate, the uh, investment promotion, trade policy, all the things that are being done, if we had been more aggressive, I think today we would have a higher growth rate. The great mistake would be to go for artificially pumping up growth, which is what we do all the time. We do that when, when growth gets uh, too low, the central bank is put under pressure to you know, reduce interest rates, and there is fiscal loosening, and we get a sugar high for a year or two, and then we are back to square one when we have to slam on the brake. So we have to break that cycle, and the only way you can do that is to do the stabilization and the economic reform side by side. On uh, FIT, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, the good news is that the, you know, the central bank is um, seeking to amend the Monetary Law Act uh, to support a flexible inflation targeting regime. Uh, and part of the, the legal and accountability frameworks that are going to be built into the, to the amended act involves greater independence for the central bank. Uh, because historically, there has been considerable fiscal forbearance. Uh, the central bank has accommodated the loose fiscal policy that I spoke about earlier. So to have a flexible inflation targeting meaningfully uh, if the central bank is given a target and it's held account accountable, in some countries the central bank governor, as you know, resigns if the target is not met. Uh, so if you have those kinds of accountability frameworks, uh, then you have to give the central bank the independence uh, to run the monetary policy so that you uh, hit your target. And we're trying to build that in uh, to the amended Monetary Law Act. The cabinet yesterday approved it, uh, approved the framework, rather, for the amendments to the Monetary Law Act. So now we have to um, do, uh, you know, enact the amended law by the end of this year. Um, and so that, you know, greater accountability on the one hand and greater independence on the other hand mm. would be the kind of two pillars on which we need to build uh, the flexible inflation targeting Thank machine. You. Thank you. Tungla, do you want to take the question on transition? Sure. Um, well, you, you will remember that uh, GSP Plus was granted back only last year in May, and that was on the basis that there was sufficient progress made by the Sri Lankan government since 2015 to get that uh, advantage back. So measured on the progress that had been made, uh, it was granted back. Now, it's not the end of the story. There's a monitoring mechanism that is in place, and the first report on 
the continuous progress, because there needs to be continuous progress, and you must avoid salient failures, as uh, the definition is, is going, to, to keep the GSP plus in place for, for each of the countries who benefit from that mechanism. The first report still shows progress, less progress in terms of, of space compared to the previous uh, beginnings, but there's still sufficient progress. But obviously there are also areas that, that have been highlighted where there are still gaps and things to be done, such as, for instance, transitional justice that you mentioned, um, things such as also um, the implementation now of the Office of Missing Persons. It's there, but it needs to, to start working. Things such as, uh, in particular, the replacement of the PTA by a new CTA act that will be in conformity with international standards, just to mention a few. Thank you. Rajesh, you want to? Yeah. Yes, I'm responding to Ganeshan's question on uh, is uh, Sri Lanka's high levels of human development is it a blessing or a curse? It's a trick question. It's an ambush question. Uh, let me just say that you can answer that question in two ways. You can answer it from an ethical, intrinsic perspective, or you can answer it instrumentally in terms of its effects on the rest of the economy or society. So from an intrinsic, ethical perspective, I think it's fantastic that Sri, Sri Lanka has high levels of human development, high levels of education, high levels of health. Uh, but from an instrumental perspective, you could say, well, what have been the impact, what has been the impact of that on society historically now? Well, on the one hand, there is reasonably good cross-country evidence and theoretical evidence that high levels of human capital, um, healthy workforce is good for economic development. So it should be a very good thing. It still has a potential of being a huge blessing. However, it's also not possible to ignore the fact that this not having been managed well and having happened in a somewhat chaotic set of circumstances, that you end up having what Albert Hirschman uh, talked about, that the unforeseen consequences of what you do often outweigh the intended consequences. And it's very difficult to look aside, uh, to set aside the fact that high levels of educated, unemployed, unemployment in the 1970s and the 1980s did play a very significant part in the rise of the war and the conflict. Uh, that if you did not, if you, if you educated your population but did not meet their aspirations to provide them with the kind of uh, employment that they found or the dignified uh, labor that they aspired to, then it can lead to, um, some, you know, it can lead to a revolution of frustrated expectations, which which has, which has happened. So I would say that in many ways it has been a huge blessing and it can still be a blessing, one that has the benefits of which have not fully been realized. However, I think it's also, and I say this as somebody that looks at it from a, a political economy perspective, you cannot disaggregate the effects of that blessing and the poor management of it from a lot of the negative consequences that subsequently arose. So when we talk about high levels of human development in Sri Lanka, I think two other factors we need to bear in mind is one, the disparities. This, this is the national average that we most often talk about. But there are at least, I think, around 10 districts where there is a huge disparity between the national average and the district level, uh, the quantitative uh, measurement of th those human development indicators. So that's one part, and then that links to the inequality uh, that we were talking about. And um, the, the, the second point is the fact that a lot of these measurements are quantitative. And they don't really look at the qualitative aspects of development. And so even when you talk about measuring uh, education or health, we know that there are huge disparities in state level, uh, you know, related to social protection systems, in, for instance, on health, on education. And then this causes further problems when you then compare it with the private sector provision of those services. So I think on, we can't just look at human development, uh, the index, or these indicators on the face of it. We really need to go into these and, and look at the qualitative, qualitative aspects of development, which is what then influences you know, the social tensions on the ground, for instance, which can then contribute to the conflicts uh, between uh, communities. 
we'll take another round of uh, questions. And this time, could, we, could you introduce yourselves, please, before you uh, ask your question? So can I, is there anyone with a question? Yeah, there's. Uh, my name is uh, Lakshman Gunasekar. I'm a journalist. Uh, but being an aging one, I'm not going to ask a question, but I'll make two short remarks. Um, firstly, uh, I fully appreciated the, the, uh, the spectrum of uh, sectors which are represented in the panel, uh, but left that spectrum left out the biggest white elephant which is in the room, and that is the politician. Uh, I am presuming that the subsequent dialogues will derive ways to engage uh, uh, politicians, not merely being, not simply the parliamentary politicians, but uh, perhaps advisors and uh, technicians at senior party levels. Because many of the problematics raised in the different sectors are due to the lack of political management and political will, particularly. So I think, as a person also who has been in civil society activism for the past 30 years, and who's also reported politics for the past 40 years, uh, we cannot forget the politics. And we cannot uh, forget, uh, we cannot rule out and ignore engagement with politicians and the political class. The engagement is not simply uh, bringing influence to bear by making policy uh, advice to politicians, but bringing them into this as part, of, as being part of stake, the stakeholders. Uh, likewise, with civil society also, I think there's need to be uh, uh, active engagement in this dialogue process with civil society. Include them also as stakeholders. Finally, may I hope that uh, one of the dialogues would focus partly even, partially even, on social communication in Sri Lanka. Uh, because as a veteran social communication actor, I am aware of one, the current problematics of social communication, the mass media industry and how it has contributed to social conflict. I'm a critic of mass media itself, an analyst. I'm also aware of the cha drastic change in mass media itself. And we have now actually gone beyond mass media. We are now in, in the internet media, which is not quite mass media. Uh, newspapers are actually dinosaurs. Uh, we are looking at the internet and the communications that are now growing and evolving with the internet. And how can we exploit that? as well as manage that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, that's, those are fair suggestions noted. Uh, just to uh, point out, on, especially on behalf of our local uh, partners here, that you will notice that there is a fairly major political development on uh, in Parliament today, which is why we've had three political actors actually drop, had to drop out rather unwillingly at the last minute. But you're quite, you know, point taken. Any other questions? Uh, there's a lady at the back and the gentleman in the front. Let's take them both together. Yeah, hi. I'm uh, Jeeva Paramapilai Essex. I'm a free citizen, uh, economist. Uh, I, I remember in the good old days uh, when I was with the LSE in the 70s, we used to talk about politics a lot. And, you know, following up from the previous speaker, I'm surprised that the LSE uh, majors. Uh, Mr. Venugopal, I think, uh, didn't mention, he talked about governance and institutions. But the question that I have is, what sort of, I mean, given the political structure today, is it a luxury for Sri Lanka to have the current political structure? You know, should we think of alternates? Just a question out there. Second question, again, on the education debate. Um, what do you think our educational system that we have, which is very much focused on uh, in our local language. And as a result, we don't have access to the internet or use technology as much as we should. Is it something that we should change dramatically overnight rather than struggling with the system that we have today? Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Surya. Um, the question I have also is relating to the education system. So, well, the fact that we have a fairly outdated content delivery and the assessment uh, system is, of course, given. I think we all understand that, and it's way uh, older than it should be. But apart from that, uh, most of our uh, 
you know, curriculum, uh, not only from schools, even beyond that, is um, geared in such a way that it, it does not really meet what is uh, in demand as far as industry is concerned. And we find those who can afford, those who have the capacity, they move out to study either overseas or study in Sri Lanka for international qualifications. And eventually, we will end up with a, a wider gap between uh, those who could make it outside and those who are going to be stuck with the local system. There's nothing wrong with the local system. To that extent, of course, most of us have come from the local system. But then again, uh, as we see, nothing much is being done. Uh, this eventually, as I have seen over the years, is one of the issues because a lot of unrest, a lot of uh, feeling that you know they, they lack opportunity because some of those others are, have managed to move on in life. They go out of the country, as uh, one of the panelists mentioned. They benefit from Sri Lanka, and eventually they go and uh, uh, make use of these skills outside. Is there anything being done in terms of, uh, because just as much as various rights, uh, you know, like the various acts that are coming into play, eventually, uh, in the years to come, if we are going to end up with a bigger gap, I think it's going to uh, uh, be a bigger problem uh, as we move on. So just an open question, is there anything being done? Because after all, all these unrest that we saw even recently. Thank you. It's easier to plant a seed only when you know that you, know, uh, you, can, you, you have a group of people who are ready to take, hang on to something uh, to, to uh, you know, make their day. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll take another question in this round. Is there another question? Uh, is anyone waiting? Yeah, the gentleman at the back. Hi, my name is Binoy. I'm representing the masterclass participants. My question is also regarding the uh, development and the education system policies, because I think it's our duty to talk about the education here. Uh, so my question is that our education system, we have a free education system here, and we get the benefit of free education, and as a result, our literacy rate has increased, but the end result, we have uh, lagging in the sectors of financial literacy, innovation, and entrepreneurship. So our end product of this uh, free education system is either to join the enterprises and work as executives, or uh, those who are capable and the cream of the education will go overseas for masters and stay there, and uh, overseas companies will headhunt them, or, and the people who, uh, who are not fitting into those two categories will be ended up being the unemployed uh, graduates. Eventually, the government has to absorb them. So the government cannot innovate, the government cannot improve productivity, and the country itself cannot Im uh, go ahead. So the development, when it comes to the development, the question is that we invest a lot in education, but the dividend of the free education is taken out from the country, and someone else is enjoying it. So is there any connectivity and coherence in policy in terms of development and education. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, who would like to take, you're a university <laughs> yeah. academic. Do you want to talk? Um, I think the first thing I have to say is, yes, we do have a free education system. But at the same time, if you look at how much money we spend on tuition, we don't have a free education system. We are taught to memorize. We are taught to follow the steps, step one, step two, step three, step three. This is how you pass the exams. We are not taught to be creative. We are not taught to be thinking out of the box. We are taught to you know, focus on this, do this way, answer this question this way only, and you get an A, go to university. And when it comes to us, and we are trying to find new innovative ways of getting them to think and be creative, have uh, panel discussions or watch and review films, they're kind of stuck. So yes, we do need innovation, but you also have realized that that as a problem has come and it's, it's just the focus on do the next exam, do the next exam, do the next exam, rather than be creative, be, you know, be curious, rather than just take things for granted. I know it's just more philosophical idea, but really have to understand that we Thank don't you. have a free education as such. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to respond to the question raised by this gentleman here about 
about uh, what is being done in terms of the education system not producing market for can, can you hear her? No. No. Sorry, I'm just responding to this question from the gentleman here around uh, the education system not producing marketable skills and that not uh, translating into jobs. Um, in terms of what we can do as donors, as the Australian government here, one example is we're working in the tourism industry in the eastern province to see how we can create more flexible market-based approaches to skills training. So what we're doing there is uh, taking a little bit from uh, our own experience back in Australia, uh, bring it here to see, as you know, the, the education system here, unfortunately, is inflexible. And when you look at uh, skills for, say, an industry, a rapidly growing industry like tourism, um, you need to have a good system that communicates with uh, the market, the industry players, uh, knows what kind of skills are required, and then are able to deliver that in a flexible, modular way. So what happens at the moment is you have these set courses that you have to sit through in classrooms. You go through two, three years of sort of diploma, certificate level, and degree level, and you come out. And by that time, the industry has changed so much that the skills that these uh, you know, youth were trained for are irrelevant now. So what we're trying to do now is model sort of work-based approaches, sandwich models where you can do training um, uh, in your workplace, come back, do a module, go back and apply it, and video-based modules, things like that. So uh, the, the idea of this program that we're running is to test out these models, and if they work, we would like to take them to scale. And of course, this is a partnership with the government of Sri Lanka, so they will be, you know, there's a commitment to take it into other districts and into other sectors. And we've seen some sort of um, interest from the, the construction sector, for example, to look at some of the models we are piloting in tourism, which could be applied there. So things are happening. They're probably not well connected at the moment, but there are different actors working on these problems. May I quickly yeah. uh, just make two points? One on, on uh, the question whether anything is being done in terms of our, our education system, education training and learning, um, skills development system. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the government, sort of what they call the 13, year, uh, 13 years of education, will entail in the future, beyond O level, there would be three streams, I believe. There would be an academic stream, a technological stream, and a stream that trains people in trades, which I think is a very positive move in terms of, because uh, uh, in the past we kind of educated everybody um, to go to university and only allowed 15% of them into university. So that was a serious uh, 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 kind of asymmetry there. But they're trying to move away from that. And if I make very quickly, I, I, I think, uh, in response to Ganeshan's uh, question about uh, whether our social development has been a, a curse or a providential legacy. I mean, I just made some important points. And, and really following on from that, I think, you know, what are the lessons of the Sri Lankan experience? Because I, th I think it's in some ways quite different and, and possibly even unique. And, and for me, the lesson is that we didn't get the balance between social development on the one hand and investment employment generation and wealth creation on the other. You know, we, we did very well in terms of uh, social development at, at a certain level, but the other side of it was not looked after in the way it should have done, and that's why you got these unintended uh, consequences. So how one strikes that balance? Uh, one of the reasons why we had a challenge in terms of striking that balance is that, uh, again, this is a very personal view and <laughs> shouldn't be attached to my official position, really almost from independence, our progress has been constrained by a rather toxic combination of populist politics on the one hand, and a rather deeply entrenched entitlement culture among the people on the other. And the two feed off each other, and it's been a non-virtuous kind of cycle which has dragged us down. Uh, and, and that's an excess. Uh, we need to address if we are to break out of that. Um, 
Thank you for those, uh, for all your responses. I think that there are just two quick things I want to say in response to the, the recent round of questions. One is, you know, talking about the education system and, and people going back. One is a, it's a simple point that a lot of uh, LSE alumni are back in Sri Lanka working, right? So they're not all staying abroad. Uh, many of them are uh, in this room. Uh, clearly, this is an opportunity. Then um, the other thing is with the CDD masterclass, you know, this was again an experiment this morning to precisely push students to ask questions, to challenge. Um, and it was very interesting that I think the method of pedagogy that we followed, which is informal, open to being challenged, lack of hierarchy, which I think uh, just working at LSE and working in a British university, which tends to be very flat in its yeah. hierarchical structure, unlike, say, US universities, there is a difference in culture. I think we brought some of that culture just in how we sat and how we interacted. And it makes an enormous amount of difference to how engaged young people are as a result. If you create the space uh, to provoke them to challenge and to ask the difficult question, that there is no right answer, that they are, in fact, in the business of looking for that right answer. And th this is why we're very committed with the CDD to doing these masterclasses, to bringing international panelists together uh, to speak to university uh, uh, students here. And finally, the point I want to make, partly because personally my re research is on democracy, uh, that's what I'm interested in, in in India, but thinking comparatively in South Asia region, I completely take the point that several people have now made, in, including in your uh, remarks on, on populism. I think there is a very uncomfortable conversation we need to have which is about uh, just looking across the region, are our political structures equipped to deal with the developmental challenges we have? Do we, I mean, we are all, all the South Asian countries are ruled by political parties who have no intra-party democracy. There are no primaries. There are no, uh, th there is an entrenchment of elites uh, within political structures, which is bound to have uh, uh, implications for uh, how they, uh, you know, the sense of social responsibility they have. Uh, so I think, I mean, at some point we would like to curate such a discussion to, to genuinely look at political cultures in South Asia to see why populism, in fact, has the uh, traction it does and why authoritarian style leadership is allowed to flourish and is able to flourish because of lack of uh, democracy within political parties, but that's for another day. But I, I think it's it's uncomfortable, but it's a, it's a common problem to many countries, not just to Sri Lanka. Um, so, would my co-panelists like to make any final remarks, or should we take some more questions? Um, are there is there anyone burning to ask a question? I think I can squeeze in a couple more. So, two people here on the left. Uh, and this time, the panelists can just make their final remarks, please, when you respond to the question. Thank you. Okay, please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Amaya, and I'm a recent a fresh graduate from the University of Colombo. Um, so I kind of now feel the need to uh, justify the free education that I've benefited from as well by asking a well-articulated question. Uh, but So let me do that, because I've got copious amounts of notes, but I wanted to make sure that the point came across. Um, when it comes to integration for development, I think it was touched on by the panelists. But uh, if we are to take an optimistic note to sustainable development in Sri Lanka, then I think integration is the best way forward. And I mean institutional integration in the public sector, and I mean integration in the policies and plans of the private as well as the public sector. So you have private-public partnerships. And this is very important to d talk about in a forum such as this, uh, because Sri Lanka is party to conventions internationally, such as uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. And we have nationally determined contributions that we are reporting on every five years. In 2020, the next document is due. And through that, we have um, national adaptation plans that the ministries have come up with. And these are solid plans and policies, in a way. But I want to know how aware, engaged, and uh, 
aware about the integration the public sector can bring into these plans is because uh, even Vision 2025, which was put out by the Ministry of Finance, if I'm not mistaken, all of these are plans for not just the development but the sustainable development of Sri Lanka. Uh, so how do we, I think integration is the most important way to go across and I hope that even the policy brief that comes out of the Colombo Development Dialogues ultimately feeds into something that the public sector and ultimately the government is doing because they are finally, the, uh, they have the agency and the mandate to carry out development in Sri Lanka. So just the connections. Yeah, I actually have uh, two questions. My name is Nirmal. I think, um, Dr. Manish, I need to uh, touch on one particular area. I think whilst you're having the master classes for the students in the education system to have open dialogue, I think there has to be a hard dialogue with the academics as well. Uh, sadly, my view and my understanding is that some of the academics in the local educational system sometimes uses textbooks uh, and reference books which are 20, 30 years of uh, age. So the new thinking does not come into the students to even have that dialogue of understanding when they're given that opportunity. So I think that's something that needs to be deeply looked into. Uh, but on, on a broader spectrum, I think my uh, comment comes to Carl and uh, Dr. Indrajit as well is on the, Im the importance of creating and establishing the social enterprise culture in Sri Lanka, uh, especially as a, as a tool of rural engagement, rural empowerment, and also creating solutions to societal and environmental problems. Now, I know we have success stories on the startup ecosystem in Sri Lanka and venture funding now coming in, but what we really need is a social impact fund, a national level social impact fund we have both from the private sector and from the public sector, we can help uh, not only in the funding, but also getting the ecosystem in place so that the societal problems can be uh, solved. Thank you. So can I just uh, invite you all to make comments in this order? So starting with you, uh, 30 seconds each, You've please. Given <laughs> me a lot of air time. So just to respond very quickly in terms of creating an ecosystem for a more integrated um, bottom-up development. Um, I think it, that are, in terms of developing an enterprise culture, probably four areas we need to operate at. Um, one is training clearly, two is having access to inputs and technology, three is financing, but probably the most challenging uh, aspect of getting um, sort of startups going of, of uh, having enter uh, social impact investment is marketing. You know, you have to be able to sell what you produce. So you need to link people up into either the local supply chains or the supply chains of the area, the, re the province or district, or to the national or international, whatever it is. But if you fix the marketing channel, everything else falls into place. People keep coming and telling me, you know, bring down interest rates, have these subsidies, throw money at the problem. You can throw money at the problem, but unless you have something to sell, it's, 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 it's uh, not going to be successful. 30 seconds. 30 seconds, yep. So I, I'd just like to leave everyone with the thought that um, the environment that we all live in and operate as organizations and entities has definitely evolved and will continue to evolve. So technology is there to actually disrupt and to actually maximize what we have. So there's no doubt in our minds that profitable growth and sustainability, doing the right thing, are one and the same. If we get that in our heads and we do that, even if there's no framework, the whole country will actually improve. Uh, for me, if I were to think of the top three things that I would like to address, um, one is definitely the political party reforms uh, that was mentioned. Uh, I think we have a patronage-based uh, system of politics in this country which is linked to a patronage-based society. And uh, we need to move to a merit-based system. Uh, in 2015, there was a March 12th movement that was uh, constituted. It was led by PAFRAN. It had about uh, the involvement of about 25 civil society organizations around the country. But unfortunately, it really didn't get the amount of support that it needed. They introduced an eight-point criteria for nomination of candidates, but you know it's really questionable as to how many people went to the polling booth and thought about those eight points. 
uh, when it came to voting for their candidates. Um, so that's one part. Then corruption within political parties. There's this whole issue of election financing. And um, in this regard, uh, I think also the private sector has a role to play uh, in uh, trying to stem uh, corruption within political parties. And OK, I'll, I'll stop at that. As a foreign diplomat, I need to be a bit careful when it comes to changing the political system here. So I will abstain from commenting here. What I know is about the need to improve education. I think that was a common denominator, and I can agree on that also. Thanks to my personal experience, as my wife uh, has been a teacher and has been confronted with the realities of the country. Just one word on the integration need for the sustainable development. Yes, I agree totally. It's also integral uh, vertical integration in relation to the authorities. And I'm saying this also based on the difficulties that we have faced, been facing in relation to certain of our projects when it came to uh, cooperate with the various levels of the authorities, national, provincial, and local levels. It has been sometimes very challenging, and it still remains. Thank you. So in terms of uh, non-traditional partnerships for development, I'd like to leave you with two thoughts. And these are two principles that we live by and we apply to our own work. The first is problem first, partner second. If you're able to identify the problem you're trying to address or the solution you want to find, you will most likely be able to find the right partners or the mix of partners that you need to address that situation. The second is that whatever partnership you go into, it must build additional value. So when you look at the equation, one plus one has to equal three or more if you really are trying to address complex development problems. Because if you end up with the same kind of you know, um, approaches, you're not going to get to innovative solutions that we were talking about. So I'll just leave you with those two thoughts. Thank you very much. I'm going to close by addressing also the question on politics. Um, yes, I think we should talk much more about politics. We should be much more informed about it. Uh, we should be much more conscious about it. Development inherently tends to be quite depoliticized. It famously renders political things technical. Uh, politics makes everything possible. Politics can close off what seems to be very logical and rational and needs to be done. So for example, depending on what happens this evening, tomorrow we would be having a very different kind of development dialogue. Uh, so politics is very, very important. But I would also caution that we should be very careful not to be mesmerized into thinking that politics amounts to the drama of high politics. Um, and that is really all that it is uh, that we should take, uh, take account of. Okay, that's it, thank you. I think um, my, my focus would be the need for an attitude change when it comes to environment, when it comes to activism, when it comes to being, for in terms of the education system, being curious. Um, because without an attitudinal change, without, without being uh, interested in the world at large and being curious and being creative, uh, you can't have innovations, you can't have the advancements that we are all hoping for. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, just to say in conclusion that the next uh, Colombo Development Dialogue will be held on the 31st of August. Uh, and this time we are going to focus much more on one topic, on the issue of water security. So watch this space. Um, you're all uh, invited to stay on for refreshments afterwards. And before we bring this to a close, on behalf of the LSE South Asia Center, I just want to really warmly thank our partners, uh, UNDP, can I just ask Fadil and Anushka to uh, show yourselves somewhere? I mean, they've worked incredibly hard. Fadil's at the back of the room, Anushka is somewhere here, and there's a whole team here. I think they deserve a warm round of applause. And, and Citra, which of course is a new innovation lab, we had a chance to go and look at their uh, space today. It's a fantastically new idea. We've been talking about innovation and the need for it. I think there is uh, genuinely uh, a new space to create ideas, test the waters uh, before rolling it out. I think it's something that you were talking about. Uh, but because the government is invested in it and is part of that project, of that innovation, 
if you have ideas that Sitra should uh, look into, do talk to uh, Fadil and others who are here. We're very grateful to Dilma for being our partners on this and to the University of Colombo. So on behalf of LSE and the LSE South Asia Center, warm thanks to all our partners and to all of you for being a fantastic audience and my panelists. Thank you. Thank you.